Good morning. It is good to see you all and good uh, to be back with you guys that are online uh, as well. We're so glad that uh, that's kind of up and running again and we got some brand new cameras uh, back there that uh, I think Ian's been enjoying playing with. Uh, he turned around to look at me now. <laughs> uh, so we're excited about what God's doing in terms of some of the online things and, uh, and making that better as we go along. Well, uh, this morning is the first morning I get to preach since the new year started. Pastor Dennis uh, preached uh, last week. And, and so uh, every year uh, from very early on when I came here, I've asked you the same question over and over. I may have missed a year ago when I was coming off of uh, a cancer treatment. But, but my question every year, every January is this. How are you more like Jesus today than you were a year ago? In what way are you more like Jesus today than you were a year ago? And I got started with this because, you know, when you're a new Christian, there's a lot of things that change and you're growing and you're becoming like Jesus and it's cool, you know, and then you kind of get in a ways and it kind of levels out. You know, you don't, it's not the same sort of things. You know, I, I doubt that you're tempted to rob a bank every week, you know, or, you know, kill somebody literally, uh, you know, every week. It, it just kind of levels out. And so I found that for me, it was important to ask this question because, Week over, day over day, week over week, month over month, I don't see much change. But over the course of the year, I, I should see change. And so uh, I'm going to continue to ask this. And so this is my question to you guys uh, today. I hope you'll think about this this week. How are you more like Jesus today than you were one year ago? And, and given COVID, you all should be growing in the area of patience in some way, shouldn't you? You're all more patient than you used. You know, maybe you're more kind or maybe you're slipped back a little on the kindness thing, you know, or... I don't know, but I think it's important for us to ask that question uh, because spiritual maturity isn't knowing more stuff, it's being like Jesus. Amen? Okay, you can know lots and lots of theology and not be in the kingdom of God. The, the Pharisees were like that. You know, you can know lots of Bible over all that kind of stuff, but it's really about being transformed into the image of Christ. So this morning, we're kicking off a, uh, a new teaching series I'm calling uh, Taking Responsibility for What You Have. We are syncing up with our children, so if you have children... Uh, here today, uh, they will be studying this same passage of Scripture, the same story. Uh, they kind of get the children version of it. You're going to get the adult version of it. But we do this intentionally to encourage spiritual conversations between parents and children. Uh, because honestly, we get your child one hour a week if you come every single Sunday. Uh, you have them all of the rest of the time. Uh, and so we just think it's really, really important to create this cross-generational sort of thing. And, and grandchildren to, to children uh, and grandparents as well. Uh, it works. And so um, kind of the question through this whole, whole series will be this. What does God say about what you do with what you have? What does God say about what you do with what you have? And the key thing there is God say, because people, all kinds of people give you advice. Uh, all, you know, I, I hope maybe you have financial planners that talk to you about that. Maybe your spouse and you talk about that. You know, maybe you talk about it with friends. Maybe, you know, um, all, all of those so sorts of things. Uh, but, but really, the, the one that matters is God, amen? You know, what does God say about this? And actually, this is going to be much bigger than, than money. Money is certainly a, a component of it, but uh, it, it's more than that. And so, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke uh, chapter 12. Uh, we're going to look at verses 13 through 21. And this is a story called The Rich Fool, uh, which is kind of an interesting sort of uh, perspective. Uh, and I'm going to kind of walk through this and pull this apart uh, kind of verse by verse, because there's some really interesting stuff going on. And then there's a twist at the end of it. And, and that's where, um, that's, that's important, because there's a certain sense, and, and rabbis did this all the time, where you kind of tell a story, it looks like he's going to go this way, and all of a sudden they go back the other way. Or maybe you've heard someone in preaching where it seems like they're talking about one thing, and at the end they kind of say something, and you go, oh, they were talking about something else. And so you really won't, you'll miss the meaning of the story uh, if you don't get that, that twist at the end. So I'm going to read the first couple, three verses uh, and then we're going to start uh, looking at them. So I begin with verse 13. What's going on is he's teaching a bunch of people. There's a big crowd he's been teaching. Someone rather rudely stands up and interrupts and asks him a question. Someone in the crowd said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me, which was a big deal in Jewish culture. There was a specific way they had to do it. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me judge or arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. And notice he says all kinds of greed, not just money greed there. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. 
So then he goes on, jumping into verse 16. He told them this parable. So he, he kind of laid the concept out, and now he's going to tell them a story that'll, that'll highlight it. Say, he says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded abundant harvest. Several things you need to notice there. Number one, he is already rich. He didn't just have a big harvest that made him rich. He is rich already, and this harvest is like over and on top of that. And so this is like, you know, Bill Gates getting an extra billion, you know? It's like, okay, <laughs> that's a lot of money for you and me, but for, for this guy, he was already there. And he, he, he is rich uh, because of God's blessing in his life. He's a farmer, right? And so God has blessed the harvest year after year after year. And so there's very clearly a connection in, in that kind of thing that, that God has blessed him and God is the one who has made him rich. And then it's important to notice, um, Jesus doesn't say anything negative about this guy. Okay. He got rich by hard work and integrity and doing the right thing and all of those sorts of things. This is the guy you want as a neighbor, okay? He did not cheat people to get rich. He didn't have any shady deals. He didn't do any of this. He, he is, he's done all of the right things. Uh, he's dealt with people fairly, and that, that's how he's got rich. So a certain man uh, had a, a great harvest, okay? Verse 17 he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. So this is a, a, an interesting sort of thing, uh, because just kind of a side thing here. Um, God has given us access to this guy's inner thinking, to his, to his mind and to his, what, he, what he's processing there, you know? And, and this is just a, a side lesson, but an, an important one, and that is this. You can't hide your motivation from God. Okay. You can hide your motivation from your friends. You can hide your motivation uh, from your boss. You can hide your motivation from your spouse, although that gets harder as the years go by. Uh, you can hide your motivation from all kinds of people, but you cannot hide your motivation. You cannot hide your thoughts from God. And so if you think that you're going to get away with something because your motives were good and you're going to trick God, you're in trouble. <laughs> Because you, can, you can't hide it from God. In fact, later uh, in the previous chapter, he says this uh, in 12, 2 and 3, he says, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known to scare anybody else. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. So everything you've said, all of that stuff you thought, nobody, else, don't tell anybody. I have bad news for you. The whole world's going to see it one day. Okay? And that, that's what it's, be careful, be careful how you talk and, and be careful about your inner thoughts because you cannot hide from God, okay? So then kind of coming back to the story, what shall I do? So he's contemplating what he should do. This isn't a casual kind of, hey, I'll do this or I'll do that sort of thing. Probably one of the reasons he's gotten rich is that he's been careful. He's been decisive. He's thought things through. He's done the right thing. He's a, he, he's a thinker in all of this. And he contemplates what is he going to do with the blessing that, that's, in, in, that's been poured out on him, okay? Um, and God has poured into his life. He's, he's kicked it around. He's probably talked with his friends. He's talked with his stockbroker. He's talked with all of those sorts of people. And so here's what it is. Here's the decision he made. Then he said, this is what I'll do. Light bulb comes on. I've got it. I know what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain, okay? And here's the bottom line in all of that. I'm going to use it to make myself richer. He's already rich, you know, but he's going to use it to make richer. He's going to have more. So it's kind of a selfish motivation in, in all of this. Then he goes on, verse 19. And I'll say to myself, so he doesn't stop with the fact that he's going to tear down the barns and, and build bigger ones. He goes on. Now he goes on and says, I have plenty of grain laid up for, my, uh, for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now this is a sad commentary because the commentary here, he says, well, now I finally have enough that I can, I, I can relax. And what that tells us is he's put his trust in his possessions. Not in God. Can I be honest? In America, that's something we struggle with. Because honestly, compared to the rest of the world, every one of you are rich. Okay? The very fact that you're sitting in a nice warm place with a cushy pew and you came out of a house that had a door on it means you're rich compared to much of the rest of the world. There's a danger in there. And I'm not going to go too far with that, because that's a, but that's an important sort of uh, thing uh, for us to, to recognize. Okay? And then, he, after his thoughts, God gives his idea about how this should have gone. If 
But God said to him, you fool. And, and, and the word fool, in, in, back in Jesus' time, that, that was the very worst thing you could call somebody. Those were fighting words. In fact, we don't probably even have an insult in, in English that's as bad as it was in the first century for one Jew to call another Jew, you fool, okay? This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then, who will get what you have prepared for yourself, okay? And so there's kind of a, a, big, a big piece there that you don't even have any family. If you were to die today, no one would even benefit from all, all of your wealth. It'd just be divided up by the government, you know, and, and you have been foolish And so then the last verse comes in and it says this. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves. And people stop right there. Well, this is what happens to rich people. But there's this important three-letter word called but is not rich toward God. And that is the twist in all of this. All that stuff about riches The real issue wasn't that he was rich. The issue was that he was not rich towards God. No place in this does he condemn the actual possession of wealth. It is when we are not wealthy towards God, when we're not rich towards God. That's the issue in this thing. And the whole idea of a rich man, it was just easy to make a great illustration. But the point is that we must be rich toward God. And we've missed it. And when we dismiss this, because we all read a rich man, and all of us go, well, good, this one's not about me. Right? <laughs> you know? But it is, okay? And so, um, but, so this is, uh, let me try this again. This is how it will be with whoever stores up riches for themselves, but is not rich toward God. And we already know, because we got insight into his inner thinking when he made this decision, He never even contemplated that in this blessing that was over the top and wildly abundant, he had gotten so much, he never contemplated how he could use it for the kingdom of God. It never occurred to him. It's just more. God's poured more blessings into my life. It must be for me. So let me say it this way. The problem is not that he is rich. The problem is that he failed to understand that he is blessed in order to bless others. That's the spiritual issue. He is blessed in order to bless. Let's say that together, that last line. He is blessed in order to bless others. This is the twitch. The the, the the twitch. (sighs) Some days. Twist. The story is about the rich fool. That's what it's called. But it isn't actually about the rich part. It's about the fool part. And it's been my experience that you're going to be a fool in any economic bracket. Amen? It's just the way it is. In fact, Scripture calls this failure of not understanding that we are blessed in order to bless others foolish, which is the worst thing that it can be called. But if you don't understand that God has blessed you so that you can bless others, you are a fool. Craig, if you don't understand that God has blessed you so that you can bless others, I'm a fool. And it doesn't matter that I have two degrees in theology and I'm ordained. You are blessed in order that you can bless. This is a fundamental bedrock principle of Christianity, that we are a people who are blessed to bless others. And and here's the truth of the matter. God has been radically generous with us. Let me try that again. God has been radically generous with us. I mean, you think about what he has poured into our lives. He has given us forgiveness of sins. That should make us permanently excited and generous. In addition to that, he's given us new life in Christ. He's made us a new creation. He has mercy for all of our failings. Ooh, let me try that again. I know some of your failings, okay? He has mercy for all of our failings. Yes, he allows us to be reconciled, to put back in right relationship with God. He gives us the Holy Spirit to guide us and keep us on track. And when death does finally catch up with us, we get heaven and the devil loses again. Neener, neener, neener. I mean, God has been radically generous. Say radically generous. Yeah, those two words should be together in Christianity. And besides that, everything you have in material blessings is you have because God made it possible in your life. Some of you are thinking, well, I worked hard. Well, who made you able to work hard? Well, I was clever. Who made you clever? Well, I was, I, you know, I had a great idea. Well, who gave you the great idea? God, God, everything we have comes 
from God. And because of all the blessings God has poured into our lives, followers of Jesus should be known for our radical generosity. I didn't get a lot of amens. <laughs> followers of Jesus should be known for our radical generosity, okay? We are the recipients of radical generosity from Jesus. We should be extraordinarily generous ourselves. Be like Jesus. That's, that's the heart of the thing. What Jesus did, we should do. He was radically generous with us. We should be radically generous uh, with him. In fact, that's what we talked about earlier. Spiritual maturity isn't about keeping all the rules, all the do's and don'ts. Spiritual maturity is about be like Jesus. And Jesus was radically generous. generous. Generosity, in fact, is what God's kingdom looks like. That's what we should be known for. I, I hate that the perception of the church is so many negative things out there. And the, the perception of the church, it should be to unbelievers that, man, I don't know about those Christians, but boy, they are generous. They really take care of each other, and they, they take care of other people. They're just, there's something about them. They're just generous. And truthfully, if you've been in the kingdom long, you've probably received another, uh, from another citizen of the kingdom extraordinary, gener extraordinary generosity in some way. I know over the years I have all kinds of ways. The one I tell people about the most was one that happened in seminary. When I was going through seminary, I, it was a struggle for me. I, I went a little older, and I had a kid, and I had to work full-time, and I was doing graduate school, and it, it was just hard. And and I would get to these places where I just wanted to quit and go home and not go into the ministry. I could make way more money in the marketplace and, and all of those sorts of things, but God would never put the, to have enough money to move home, and I want to quit at the same place. Whenever I came to a place where I got like, okay, I'm ready to quit, God would take all the money away so I couldn't leave, you know. And that's the way God works sometimes. But anyway, I had hit the bottom of the bottom of the bottom, the very worst one of all, where I, I was done emotionally. I didn't want anything to do with this. I, you know, it, I won't go into the details. It was a disaster. And I finally just went to the seminary and I said, I'm done. I'm dropping out. I can't do this anymore. And I, and I went home. Uh, and there was a, a professor there, Dr. Henry Smits. He was a philosophy professor, gifted, brilliant man. Um, the, and we'd gotten to know each other and he was kind of connected through family. And uh, somewhere along the line, he found out that I had quit seminary and was preparing to, to move back home and, and be done with the whole thing. Um, and he came, and I don't know how he found my address, maybe through relatives or something, or a professor. Maybe he just looked it up on the thing, now that I think about it, you know. But he came, and there was kind of a knock on our door in that little bitty apartment there in Kansas City. Uh, and he came in, and I, I didn't even want to talk to him. I went in the bedroom. I mean, I was in not good, good shape. And he talked to Jody for a little bit, and she finally came back and talked to me, and she said, listen, you gotta, you got to talk to this guy, because he's really concerned about you. He really has been praying about it. You know, he really believes you need to be in seminary, and God has really laid something on his heart. And as it turned out, what God laid on his heart was he paid for my next semester of seminary, which is a lot of money on a professor's salary. And I'm telling you, as much as I wanted to quit, you cannot quit school when someone else pays, for the, <laughs> pays the tab. It's like God boxed me into a corner. And as a result of that, I ended up getting through and becoming a pastor today. I don't know that I would even be a pastor today had it not been the fact that somebody in the kingdom of God gave extraordinary, radical generosity to me. And we've had the opportunity to do that before to other people as well. Um, and it feels really cool when you do that. I'm telling you, when you give generously, there's something about that. In fact, the sad part of this story, a part of it is, the rich fool missed God's blessing in his life. He thought the blessing was the abundant harvest. That was not the blessing. The blessing would have been in using it for something that mattered for eternity. That would have been the real blessing in all of that. And in fact, it's really sad, even beyond all of that, this story, as I've gotten into this story, I just, it's kind of been eye-opening for me. Because this is, this is not sacrificial giving. You know, we ask you sometimes to give sacrificially, give till it pinches. That there's, and there's absolutely a place in the kingdom of God for that, and often God talks about this. But this is abundance giving. This guy could have given away the whole crop, and he still would have been fine. He had all the material possessions he had ever needed. This was something where he could have done for the kingdom of God what God wanted him to do for the kingdom of God, and he never would have noticed it. He would have continued with life normally. This is, a, say, abundance giving. Yeah, that's when God asks you to give out of something. He's just kind of poured a whole bunch of in, into your life. God wants to bless you. He wants to give you these kind of abundant kind of blessings. 
It's, it's, it's like a parent, like a child. How many of you enjoyed blessing your children as they were growing up, you know? We just came through Christmas. That is such a cool time. When they hit a certain age when they're still grateful, <laughs> you know? And, and you, Christmas, they're, they're excited. And, they, you know, that, God has that for you. He wants to bless you uh, abundantly. But there's a danger. God wants to bless you, but he doesn't want to make you selfish. That, that kind of defeats the purpose. Have you ever been around an adult that as a child was never made to act responsibly? Have to work with them? Oh, man, that's so crazy. When I was in school, the, all you had to say is group project with a group grade. Oh, because there was always like three guys that didn't do the work, and you had to do all the work in order to get it all done, you know? It was just, it was hard. And, and in fact, um, the, the, a part of this is, is just the selfishness of this guy. He just... He just couldn't get it done. He couldn't, it made him so, in fact, you see it in the pronouns. Listen to these pronouns. My crops. My barns. My grain. My goods. Finally, my soul. It's just not a failure to recognize God's blessing in his life. He's taking credit for and ownership of what came from God and belongs to God. Everything we have belongs to God, amen? Because I've done lots of funerals and nobody takes it with them. Haven't seen one yet, you know? And it was here long before we are. We check it out and we use it, and then at the end we check it back in. It all belongs to God. And so when we miss that, we misunderstand how God's economy works, how the real world works. And so the problem isn't that the dude is Jeff Bezos rich. The problem is his heart. And it's a huge problem. As all of the Bible stories, it's not the circumstances, it's, it's the heart. So I, I want to say this carefully, but I want you to hear this. Blessing has the potential to corrupt our souls. Blessing has the potential to corrupt our souls. My dad used to say this all the time. I, he thought it was a joke. I didn't think it was a joke when I was a kid, but he used to say, yeah, God can't give me money because it'd probably mess me up and I'd be selfish with it, you know? I think there's an element of truth to that. I don't think, you know, money is the only kind of blessing there is. Maybe, certainly not the most important one. Family is far more important than that one. But there's an element of that. And so I am glad for my dad's teaching in my theology because one of the things growing up in Grace Harbor, I like is boats. And so like, you know, how Facebook is. So I, maybe a year ago, I happened to swipe on a thing about yachts, like super yachts, you know, so I look at, so now yachts come up on my Facebook feed all the time. So I'm always looking at yachts. And so now I have this desire. Lord, would you please bless me with a yacht? You know what he said? No. <laughs> I don't think a yacht is in my future. Because honestly, I'm pretty sure that would make me selfish. I just, I, I, you know, I don't know. And notice in this story, there's no one else in this story to get his inheritance. That, that means there's no wife. There's no family. No friends. There's no kids. It's just this man and the blessing that God gave him that he hoarded, the money. He shut everyone else out of his life. He's rich in money, but poor in spirit. Poor towards God. Poor towards relationships. Poor towards the things that really, really matter. There's an interesting line in the Lord's Prayer that for a long time I didn't understand. and This thing helped me, but I, any, anyway. There's a line that says, lead us not into temptation. I've always struggled with that, I thought. God does not lead people into temptation. What does that mean? You see, I, I don't think that's really not I, about God leading me into temptation. I think when I pray that, I am saying to God, I give you permission to not pour blessings into my life that would turn into a temptation that might make me lose my soul. Rats, there goes the yacht. I, and I think that's an important thing to pray. Say, Lord, I, I want all the blessings you want to pour into my life, but Lord, if it's a blessing that would corrupt my soul, don't pour that into my life. Don't let me get into that place. What a, what a mature, what an insightful thing for Jesus to teach us to pray. Because I believe that generosity is the vaccine for selfishness. It's, it's the thing that, that gets rid of it. Selfishness is the opposite of God, and generosity is the heart of God. And when we are generous, it, it, it gets rid of that selfishness in, in us. These blessings that he gives us. In fact, the illustration I think about is that we're supposed to be rivers, not ponds. Okay? Most of you know I spent like 20 years in the Midwest in Missouri. And in Missouri, when I, you know, you wanted to go fishing, you went to a pond. Okay, they have all these giant ponds, and they're ugly. 
and they're brown and murky and like stuff grows on the sides and sometimes stuff's floating around in there. You pull a fish out, you're like, do I really want to eat this fish? You know, it's kind of good. And that was hard for me because I grew up out here. That was illustrated when we were on vacation. We took the kids, we were driving through and we went to Multnomah Falls, if you've all been there. Beautiful, beautiful falls. But then the, the river it goes out underneath and you can kind of go over the walkway as a part of that. And I went over that walkway, and I'd been gone from here for a long time, so I'd kind of forgotten. I thought all water was brown, right? And I looked over the edge of that, and you could see all the way to the bottom of the river. I said, kids, kids, come here for me. you got to see this, you know? Yeah, I said, and the reason for that is the pond, the water is stagnant. The blessing comes in, but it doesn't go out until it evaporates. But in a river, just a second, the water just passes through, passes through, passes through, and it keeps it clean and, 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 and pure. And, and so we are to be rivers. God pours blessing into us that gets on to the next person. We bless people around us. We are blessed in order to bless others. And so I, I want to encourage you to try giving some blessing away. So give, give, bless somebody else with what, what God has done in, in your life. And here's the really cool news when you do that. It's about um, God gives us stuff, gives us blessing, so that we can join our Father in his work. So that you become like Jesus, but you be a part of it. There's this really cool meme. I should have put it up there. It's just a picture of, of a, a guy, looks kind of like a cowboy, and he's kind of bent over the front of an of a, um, old pickup truck with the hood's up, and he's down in there, and he's kind of, kind of working on it, you know. And right next to him is a kid that looks to be about six, seven years old, and He's bent over the truck helping dad. You know, and that, that, every time I see that one, it's like, ah. Uh, because I think that's the way God does it with us. You, you, you know you're not the primary mover in God's work, right? You know, you're, you're the little kid helping with God. And, and he's pouring blessings in you. He's saying, here's one of my tools. This, this, this blessing's one of my tools. Come on, son, come and, come and help me. T turn that, 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 that wrench right there a little bit or pound on, on, on that a, a little bit. That's why he's giving you blessings. He says, come and join me in, in, in the work. And we get to be a part of God's work on earth with the blessings. What a huge honor that is. And so I just, I just want to encourage you. Your stuff is an opportunity for God to use you for the kingdom of God. And can I tell you a secret? You are rich in something. I mean, again, we get hung up on the money part of this story. And, and all of us, we, have, we all of us have money. We should all use it for the kingdom compared to the rest of the world for sure. But there are other blessings. Some of you have skills that you can use to bless others. We see this a lot of times with medical personnel that will go on mission trips and they'll, they'll do like dental work for, for people in third world countries or nursing work or, you know, all, all kinds of stuff like that. Some of you have expertise. I had a guy in my last church that was really good. He was a bookkeeper. or Actually, he was an accountant. And when people struggled with how to handle their finances in our church, we would send them to Carl, and Carl would help them straight them out. Several people were like, he changed my life, because all of a sudden I could you have expertise. Some of you have wisdom. You're just really good with life. Some of you have power that you can exercise. Some of you have platforms that you can speak out for people. By the way, this is the gift of a politician. They have a platform. Wouldn't, don't you wish they would all use it for God and for the kingdom of God, for, instead of all the stuff they use it for now? Some of you have energy. Some of you, like me, had energy, you know? Some of you have brains, or you, you have a home that can be used for the kingdom, or you have a boat for the kingdom. I, I knew a guy that, that bought a really nice boat, and it was a ministry for him. He'd take people out in it all the time. They would do Bible studies out there while fishing. That's a great combination. He would take people that didn't know Jesus, you know? Some of you have toys that can work, a, a cabin or a network or relationships, connections, experience. What do you have? You have blessings. What are the blessings in your life? You are rich in something, some part he's put into that. In fact, there's even just a little bit of a warning. At the end of the same chapter, we find these words. To whom much is given, much will be required. When much is given, much will be required. So let me ask you this question. I know you're rich in blessings, but are you rich toward God? Kramer, if you'd come, we're going to sing in just a minute. Are you using the blessings God has poured into your life to bless others? Are you hoarding it? Are you a pond or are you a river? This week, bless someone out of your abundance. Again, this is abundance giving. 
This, this isn't the sacrificial, oh, i got to scrape every penny together so I can help, and we're not going to eat unless God comes through. This is God has already poured a bunch of this into your life. He was already rich when he got the huge blessing. What are the blessings in your life? Who can you bless with that blessing? I, 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 this week, I want to challenge you. This week, find somebody. Maybe it's helping them balance their checkbook. Maybe that's your gift. Maybe it's, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is in your life. But I know that you are rich in blessings. God has blessed you in some way. And I challenge you to bless someone else with it and thus become rich toward God. Say rich toward God. Father, I pray that we would be a generous people. What, what a great story, Father. And, and don't let us get out of it because we think we don't have a lot in the checking account. That This is really not about the material blessings, but it's about all the blessings you pour into our lives. And I pray this week that that our community, a little old Marysville, Lord, will be different because this church went out and decided to bless people out of the abundance of the things that you have put into our lives, Father. We love you. We thank you for the blessings. We confess, Father, that all the blessings belong to you, and we ask now that this week you would use the blessings in our lives to bless others. Bring glory to your name, to advance your kingdom. Ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.